Welcome to the National Prayer Luncheon for Life Pro-Life Impact Show, bringing you powerful interviews with leaders from high-impact organizations, helping you to learn about more ways you can get involved and make the greatest impact to help save lives from abortion. Here are your hosts, Karen Garnett, Chief Culture Officer at Heroic Media and President of National Prayer Luncheon for Life, and Brett Atterbury, President and CEO of Heroic Media and Chairman of National Prayer Luncheon for Life. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the National Prayer Luncheon for Life Pro-Life Impact Show. This is our very first show in post-Row America. We're so very, very excited about what God has done and this tremendous victory that we have just experienced together I am Karen Garnett. I am the Chief Culture Officer for Heroic Media and President of National Prayer Luncheon for Life. Brett is out today, so I will be solo hosting. National Prayer Luncheon for Life is a year-round initiative that elevates and celebrates high-impact pro-life organizations so that together we can accelerate winning more battles and ultimately winning the war to protect pre-born human lives from the evil of abortion. And I am so excited today to welcome to this first pro, post row America episode our dear friends from Priest for Life, Father Frank Pavone, who serves as the National Director of Priest for Life, and Janet Morana, who is the Executive Director of Priest for Life. Father Frank and Janet, thank you so much for joining us today. It's our pleasure. Great to be with you. So again, it's historic times before we go any further, as we do with every show, I'd like to just stop and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come and be with us and guide our conversation. So bow with me for a moment, please. Heavenly Father, Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are so grateful to you, Lord God, the author and creator and Lord and giver of life for this tremendous victory that we have just experienced together in our country after 49 long years of praying and working for the overturning of Roe v. Wade. We thank you, Lord, for the five to four decision that was issued by our Supreme Court justices on June the 24th. We thank you, Lord, that this Independence Day that we just celebrated a couple of days ago that for the first time in 49 years since that tragic and erroneous Roe v. Wade decision was handed down on January 22nd, 1973, that preborn children's unalienable right to life was being fully legally protected in numerous states around our country. We thank you for the victory, Lord. We give all the glory to you. I thank you, Lord, for Father Frank and for Janet, for the work of Priests for Life and all of its ministries, for the work of the collective pro-life movement over these many decades. Ask that you would bless them, Lord, bless all who are listening, bless all who are continuing to work in this battle because we know we have not yet won the war, even though this was a tremendous victory. We thank you, Lord, for all who are joining us and watching and listening, and we ask that you would bless them. We lift all of their intentions to you. Come, Holy Spirit, and Jesus, we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, well, I was praying a lot about, Lord, who should be the first guests on our first post row America episode of the show? And I was just so excited that you were available uh, to to do this with us this week at this time. Uh, we go so far back with, with one another in, in just the history of this work. Uh, I know, Father, you were ordained in 1988. Janet, you were right there in his parish. You guys got started immediately. I, the same, started in, back in 1989. Uh, we first met. I remember, Father, when you came through Dallas the first time in 94. Um, Janet, I met you at the HLI in 98. My first March for Life was with Norma, uh, with you guys uh, back in 2000. And so just wanted to talk a little bit about um, Norma and our relationship with Norma. Norma, who was the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade, especially with some of the confusing things that have been put out in the news. We wanted to celebrate with Norma, even though Norma has already gone to her eternal reward. 
talk about Norma a little bit, talk about the actual Dobbs decision, um, what's in it. Father, you are absolutely an expert on this, and I'm excited to be able to share what I've been learning from you in this. And uh, and then also the work of Priest for Life and as we move forward from this moment. So just to begin, um, why don't you guys uh, kick it off with, with um, you know, Norma, as far as relationship with Norma, when you first met Norma, the role in uh, in Norma's life that you guys very specifically played. Yes. Well, you know, the other day when uh, the Dobbs decision came out, that was the, the first thing you said, Janet, when we were getting your reaction, because we were doing this. We were broadcasting right. yeah. live <clears throat> as we were watching the SCOTUS blog. And uh, then it came out and I read the holding of the decision. And you right away, tell, tell them what you uh, what you Well, said. right away, I just looked up and said, Norma, promises kept. We did it. But what you always wanted to see a row overturn, we did it. You know, the whole pro-life movement did it. And I think, Karen, that to me, that's the most important thing is that it wasn't just Mississippi doing this. It's decades of pro-life groups all over our country constantly working and working. And I always remember, Karen, that the pro-life legal arm of the movement, all these legal experts that were pro-life always said, we will not overturn Roe until we have a willing court. Well, thanks to President Trump, we got three more conservative justices. So now it, we were ripe for it. We have a willing court. And so I think when you say, Father, that that was the dynamic that got us to this point. Sure, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and also, you know, all the preparation that uh, has happened with the education and the lobbying and, and many other elections. But Norma was looking at all this from the point of view of, you know, bearing a very heavy burden right. uh, of being the Roe of Roe v. Well, Wade. And yeah. And I remember when we took her on a Rachel's Vineyard retreat, because remember, she always said, all these children are dying because I put that my name on that paper, mm -hmm. not even thinking what was really going to happen. You know, I, yeah. I, I was hungry. The, they promised me lunch. I had pizza and I put my name down. But she always felt a burden. You know, there's that story about she would see a playground empty and thinking of the, the children that should be there, you know, because of her. So we took our Karen on a Rachel's Vineyard retreat uh, where she came to grips with her grief. And I, I noticed after that, she changed her ministry name, remember, from, from uh, Row No More to Crossing Over. Because yeah. she felt she crossed over into the real forgiveness of the Lord yes. uh, for, for what she had done. She felt started the whole thing. And, you know, Karen, I think another important fact is that people don't realize that both Norma McCorvey and the, the, the Doe of Dovey Bolton, Sandra Kano, went, tried to get their decision overturned themselves. They, they petitioned the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Alan Parker from the Justice Foundation there in San Antonio, were, they were his clients. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court, because we had more of a, a, a liberal court at that time, uh, would not grant them certiorari to hear the case. But both Norma and Sandra, it was in their heart of hearts to see that said, those two decisions overturned. It was a daily, a daily burden for her. Even after, you know, she knew God forgave her. She said, I'm a new creation in right. Christ. But the burden, and I saw the same thing in Dr. Nathanson's uh, attitude as he was doing pro-life work, uh, Nathanson being one of the key architects of the abortion right. industry in America. <laughs> Uh, there were, the burden uh, of guilt turned into a burden of uh, reparation. L let's see if we can undo some of the evil that we were responsible for unleashing right. on the world. Yeah. Uh, so this would have been a day of, of just, she would have been up there on the ceiling. Oh, <laughs> jumping for joy. <laughs> jumping for joy. Yeah. But of course, Karen, you know, <clears throat> father and I, um, I would say we met first met Norma in about 1996. Well, five, I uh, I received a fax uh, from, um, of course, our friend Flip Benham. Uh, Karen, mm -hmm. as you know, baptized her once she yeah. became pro life. He baptized her the very day of her baptism. I got a fax uh, from one of Flip's uh, associates saying Norma is baptized today or is being baptized today. And uh, that was the trigger then for me to reach out to her and get start getting together with her uh, on my right. visits to uh, to the Dallas Fort Worth area. And right. it's from that yeah. that she expressed that eventually, uh, not too much later, 
a, a desire to become a Catholic. And I know both Father Frank and a uh, dear Father Robinson, Robinson, who's also gone, yes. gone to be with the Lord, uh, were, were responsible for bringing her the catechesis of the Catholic Church. Um, and one of the things, remember, she used to love doing, especially uh, when she had the COPD and she couldn't get out and speak anymore, she was she was making rosaries in her well, house. Well, we would very often, you know, on my visits out there, I would um, uh, say, hey, Norma, can, I'm going to be in Dallas. Can I stop by? Oh, yeah, you know, stop by. And maybe it'd be after coming into the airport, maybe, you know, 8 o'clock, 8.30 right. at night. Walk into her uh, living room, and there she was uh, making, making rosaries. rosaries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, 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 yeah. Uh, well, and, you know, it is, <clears throat> I think what everyone has to understand is, you know, Karen, you, Father, and I have a, a unique thing here because Norma was our friend. Yes. Uh, she stayed at my home. Uh, I stayed in her home in Dallas. You, I know, had her in your home. I mean, this just wasn't like, oh, we knew the Jane Roe. She was our friend. Right. Um, yeah. She always called me the woman of the East. You know, that was my nickname. I used to send her bagels from New York. She loved New York bagels. And her favorite was onions. She used to love the onion ones. Uh, She would put in her order and I would FedEx them to her so they would get there fresh. You know, and then, of course, you know, there's been all this controversy about Norma um, with that one movie saying, Mm -hmm. oh, she was really, uh, you know, uh, for abortion and we uh, misguided her and all that. It's such baloney. Such baloney, because we knew Norma in her heart of hearts was 100% pro-life, wanted to see Roe v. Wade overturned. And in fact, Karen, you visited her a lot when she was in the hospice in her final uh, weeks and days. And Father Frank and I spoke to her less than an hour before she passed. Her daughter, Melissa, called us because Norma wanted to talk to Father Frank and I. And she had us promise that we would continue the fight to see Roe overturned. I mean, that was on her deathbed. So everyone right. else can put out all the phrases they want. Well, people always want to steal. You know, it's, <clears> it, <throat> it, 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 it's the devil that comes to steal and, and yes. destroy. People mm-hmm. always want to destroy the, the the legacy, the memory, the history. Right. Look how they're ripping up the history of the United States and 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 its founders. These woke left uh, uh, right. man, maniacs. Uh, and so the enemies of the movement always try to do the same thing. They'll try. Right. To, but uh, we know Norma uh, as our friend, yeah. and I think Father yes. could tell uh, Karen for the audience a, a funny story. Uh, tell everyone, Father, the ho- holy water story. When she was first like a baby Catholic. This was when when she was. Well, she, I don't think she probably was, wasn't hadn't been wasn't confirmed even, yet. Uh, received yet into the church, and uh, she had come to. Um, she had asked me to come to bless her house, and so I brought holy water, and she was fascinated by you know sprinkling the holy water. Oh, can I have some of that? You know, so I blessed a big jar of water like this. <laughs> right. I said, okay, showed her how to bless herself and whatnot. And a few weeks later, I was on a phone call with her, and I said, so how's your, you know. Supply of holy water going. (laughs) Oh, Father, she said, uh, uh, my friend and I forgot it was holy water, and we drank it. (laughs) (laughs) Is that a problem? Yeah. (laughs) I said, no, now you're holy on the inside, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just to, yeah, just add a little bit more, and thank you for sharing all of that. Um, we, We loved Norma. Yes, she came out of the, she had, as we know, her story, super difficult life, troubled life, um, did not want the abortion, you know, to do what the the abortion that she, when she signed the affidavit for Roe v. Wade, did not know that it was going all the way to the court and it would result in all of, um, you know, the abortions that she was not responsible for individuals choosing abortion. She was not responsible for abortionists committing abortions, but she did carry that burden. However, um, she, she truly found, I think, uh, love and peace when she came out of working in the abortion industry. She'd worked in four different abortion facilities in Dallas before Operation Rescue moved in right next door to her abortion facility. She came out. Um, you, father, you, I remember you flying over, you were working in Rome at the time, and you flying over to confirm her when she came into the church in, in um, August of 98. Right, and right. we we loved her. She became a member, a beloved member of the pro life family. And you're absolutely right. You know, we were friends with her for 22 years. And and she'd moved away for a few years. She moved back to Dallas in 2012 for her last three years. Moved in with a beautiful saintly woman here who took her in. She lived with her rent free. 
And yes, when Norma was, you know, coming to the end, her daughter called and said, you know, this would be the time to come see her to say goodbye. And um, I did. I drove down there and was able to spend three nights with her in the hospital and, and when she moved over to the hospice and pray at her bedside, represent the church, ask forgiveness for any harm or wounds that she may have experienced from our, you know, the pro-life movement over the years. And um, yeah, same with you. The morning that she was passing, um, I got to tell her I love her over the phone. Love you too, baby. And the, the songs, Divine Mercy Chaplet that I had been playing at her bedside, they actually had put the phone on her chest and, uh, it was just, we couldn't be there. She called you guys. Uh, we were there, even though we weren't in person. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it was the three of us who were her last, um, you know, family members in pro-life. Yeah. To journey and accompany her. And then her daughter also asked us to come and, and uh, do this service. Father, you presided at her funeral the week later. I, I spoke. The pro-life movement covered the expenses of, of Norma's funeral. So, and we had the text messages from Melissa, you know, thanking us and telling us how much we meant to Norma and how she just wanted so much for the babies to be protected. We have right. that. So as far as any confusion out there, um, you know, we hope that our sharing today uh, is helpful in terms of making some, some, uh, bringing some clarity to all of that. Right. Well, you know, Karen, the other thing I always point out when I give talks about Norma is that tell me what court case you have ever heard of where the plaintiff never spent one day in court? Now, from the time she signed with Sarah Weddington, she she never spent one day in well, court. Well, this is the not in, thing. Not in yeah. Dallas, not well, in the federal, and not in the Supreme. Well, here's, here's the thing about Roe v. Wade, and a lot of people don't realize this. Part of the weakness of Roe v. Wade, and is one of the reasons that the court overturned it, uh, it, it there's no record. Now, now let that sink in for a minute. People might think you're they're mishearing me. Every court case has a record. You know, you have a set of facts, you know, depositions, uh, testimonies, a trial. You know, there's no record. There's the affidavit from a Jane Roe, Roe Ro versus Wade, and in in the companion case Dovey Dovey Bolton. You look at the oral arguments that were held in the Supreme Court. These cases were argued twice. Twice. Okay, right. in 71 right. and 72. And the justices are sitting there, and literally at a certain point they ask, are there any facts in this case? Right. Are there any facts in this case? And, and like you say, Norman didn't appear in court because there's no record. There was no trial. Um, and it went furthermore from usually these cases go from the district court, which is the lowest level of federal court, to the appellate court. And then if, 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 they, if they accept it up to the Supreme Court, this case skipped the uh, appellate court. Appellate. There was no appellate review. The appellate court gets to review the record, the facts, you know, ask questions, you know, clarify things, say, oh, yeah, that this never isn't happened. really valid. Didn't even happen. It no. skipped the appellate uh, court, went right up to the Supreme Court. And here's another fascinating fact. When the justices accepted Roe v. Wade, some of them thought, that the case was about procedural and jurisdictional questions. Namely, could a federal court intervene in a state criminal process? Right. They thought it was just a technical matter. They didn't think it was about granting the right to an abortion. So one of the reasons why the arguments in Roe are so weak constitutionally is that these justices weren't prepared. Right. And at the oral arguments... Both times, it was mostly a question about procedures and jurisdiction, not about the hardcore substantive issue of is there such a thing as a well, right and, to abortion. And Father Frank, how come not once did any of the justices ask, well, where's the plaintiff? Where's Jane Roe? How come they didn't ask it, that? It was a, it was that a sham. The whole thing was a sham. Yeah. I well, mean, and, the, and let's add this, too, for those who you know don't know the story. Norma never heard anything again from Sarah right. Weddington or Linda Coffey. Yeah. They didn't call her to tell her that Roe v. Wade had been issued. She read it in the newspaper. That's how right. she found out. And, and right. it, there was a lot. Of, Karen, uh, back, Karen, there's a funny story. I don't know if you remember this one. On January 22nd, 1973, you're correct. 
Norma found out, not by a phone call from Sarah Wedding when we won, but actually she opened the door to her house, the, the, her place that morning, bent down, picked up the Dallas paper, and it said, Roe v. Wade, you know, blah, 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 Lord of the land. She comes in to the kitchen and takes the paper, throws it on the table, and says to her friend who was living with her at the time, uh, Miss Connie, she goes, you know who that is? She goes, no. She goes, that's me. I'm Jane Roe. And Connie goes, yeah, and I'm the Queen of England. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> and, I mean, yes. Yeah. So, so fast forward. Well, no, before before we get there, this is one of the things that, uh, you know, obviously the, the decision was get, issued, Dobbs, on um, the 24th of June. And I have heard a number of people say in giving interviews and things, um, in, in the joy of all of this, that they said they they didn't believe they would see it happen in their lifetime. And I'm not one of those. And I know you all no. aren't either. Uh, and I think part of that is um, like for me, I want to give a, 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 you know, a shout out to Mark Crutcher, head of Life Dynamics, um, because Mark was putting on life activist seminars in the early 90s. Right. And one of the things that Mark said was that just in the patterns of history, when you have grave injustices, that they can't go on forever. And, and you know, he so he planned and he actually said then that he didn't think Roe would survive to 50 or he'd give it 50 years. Right. So in, in the back of my mind, I was always like, OK. And also, I think it's just that we just have such a heart for this is the greatest injustice we've ever experienced. And it it just grieves our hearts so much that God, as we cry out to you, God, God, please let me see this in my lifetime. And I, I never disbelieved that I would see it in my lifetime. Now, as we know, just what you said at the very beginning, Janet, what with all the decades of the work in all the different areas to help change people's minds and save, thank the Lord, save so many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives along the way, we've still had this, you know, dark cloud of row over our country, not allowing the states to restrict or, or make um, it illegal again. Um, it took 2016, right? The most unlikely person running for president that it was very, very hard for many people, myself included, to embrace the possibility of Donald Trump becoming president. And I remember um, in the summer of 2016, Marjorie Dannenfelser stepped up, stood up and became chairing, I think you, Father, may have co-chaired that with her, um, the, forming the, the pro-life coalition around yeah. the Trump oh. mm -hmm. and 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 made him actually, you know, he signed the pledges, the promises that he would appoint originalist justices, not not appoint, I'm sorry, nominate. And uh, I think that was a huge turning point because we wouldn't have, we would not have Dobbs, we wouldn't have Dobbs without Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, and um, right. we would not. So, so, so that I just wanted to share that for for me in terms of I thought it would happen in my lifetime. If you guys want to comment on that from your perspective, well, you know, uh, Karen, <clears throat> Father Frank and I were at Trump's inauguration, and like you said, we worked very hard for his uh, election. And that morning, or I think no, it was the night before, we were at a, a evangelical service, and I'll never forget what the pastor preached. He preached Isaiah 45, mm -hmm. right, Father? And, and he says, and President Trump is the 45th president. So God is going to use President Trump like... Uh, King Cyrus. Like, used King Cyrus, right? Who right. wasn't a believer, but right. let God's people go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple right. after the exile. After the exile. And so when he preached that, I remember that night going back to our hotel. Remember I said to you, Father? I said... You know, I'm in New York. I've known that Trump family my whole life. And, you know, I wasn't crazy about his election, you know, about voting for him. But I did it because, you know, it was the logical pro-life choice. But once I heard that preacher, I said, this has now been anointed by God. 
he took for the 45th president, Isaiah 45, somehow he's going to use this man yeah, yeah. To, to do God's that work. Great. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. So that's how I, like my heart, like got really excited. I voted for him, but now I was excited about his presidency yeah. because somehow I said, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to be, but God is going to use him to save the unborn. And yes. I, I just wasn't sure. And you sure. know, in that election, then the <laughs> statistical uh, uh, surveys uh, show this, how many voters, many of you among them, were voting specifically with the Supreme Court in mind. That's right. And we were preaching that all the time. We said, listen, this is not just about the next four years. It's about the next 40 years. 40 years. It's about the way that's because the Supreme, because we knew because of the ages of the justices, right. it wasn't hard to figure out that there were going to be for President Trump, two, maybe even three. This is exactly what everyone was saying, right. who was analyzing this, two, maybe three. Supreme Court nominations that he'd be able to make. And we knew that they were going to be good, uh, solid uh, justices. Right. And lo and behold, not only did it happen, but they ended up voting right. for the overturn of Roe. And I think yeah. what's really important right now is we have, we have finally seen a beautiful shift in the court that, you know, in addition to abortion, Things like religious freedom, you know, there are, yes, other yes. there are other decisions, you know, now you can pray at a football game or any other place and, and not lose your job because yeah, you, yeah. you want to kneel and, and thank the Lord for, yeah. the, for the game. I mean, <clears throat> and then, you know, there was a uh, gun rights things also were protected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the issues that conservative people are in their hearts, they've worked so hard for all these different groups, again, because of President Trump putting true constitutionalists on the bench, yes. things are changing. Because the other uh, side, you know, the, the, the liberals, they, they misinterpret. I mean, like you were saying in the classes we did, oh yeah, they, they try to find a right to abortion in the constitution. Yeah. It's not there. Right. It's right. not there. Right. You know? right. So yeah. um, I just yeah. say, praise God Amen. that we have a, a more logical, sound thinking court. No matter, you know, they're out of session now. Who knows what the fall will bring, but I'm just so joyous and confident whatever comes before them, it's going to be, you know, what God would want. You know, it's, we finally got people who have a little sense in their brains. Well, you Karen, know? you remember all the talks that uh, I gave over the years, over the decades, the pro-life movement is winning. Right. right. In fact, you sponsored some of those special <laughs> talks. And you said, well, Father, what do you mean by the pro-life movement is winning? And, you know, we would trace, uh, you know, using the, from the civil rights uh, era, the, 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 uh, the uh, teaching, no lie can live forever. Right. No mm -hmm. lie can live forever. Right. So, um, and finally, the, uh, the analogy we would always use, then people would say, why is it taking so long to, to overturn Roe v. Wade? And we pointed out, look, Plessy versus Ferguson, that, that, that legalized segregation, wasn't overturned until Bo Brown versus Board of Education 58 years later. Right. 58 years. And, 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 and I know, would always point out, you know, we're well within the historical time frame, time frame right. uh, for big injustices like this to be reversed. And when that decision came down, just like we have all the craziness happening right now with the picketing of the justices' houses, destroying pregnancy centers and churches. Well, back when that came down, we had the Ku Klux Klan, right, kicking up a storm in the South. It's not like everyone all of a sudden went, oh, okay. Uh -huh. Oh, no more segregation and we're going to all be hearts and flowers now. No, there, there was a lot of, it took a long time. I can remember in the 60s, uh, there was the Civil Rights Act that came mm -hmm. and that kind of, that was like the follow-up to... Well, yeah, a lot the, of work had... A lot of more work had to be done. Yeah. So people should not be shocked right now that the other side is unhinged. You know, the devil is just spewing around because he, he lost a big battle right now. And it's going to take a while, you know, for all the states to... There'll be some more battles in court. We're not done. But we have to take this as a monumental victory yes. to be encouraged. But now, brothers and sisters, oh boy. Do we have our work to do? And this election in November, boy, oh boy, everybody right now, you better check your voter registration. Go to um, checkyourvoterregistration.com. Make sure everything's in order because we have to turn out in droves mm. to Let take back the House, increase the Senate, because mm. it's not just the states, Karen. I'm reminding everybody. You got to worry about the federal too, Congress. Yes. Because let, they let, me, let, me, uh, let me ask you this. It's, you touched on this a little bit ago, and I think it's a really critically important point for for our viewers 
and listeners, you mentioned, Janet, that you and father worked hard to get Trump elected, uh, President Trump elected. And so here we are. We're with 501c3 organizations. Um, mm -hmm. We, we as, as 501c3s, can neither endorse nor oppose candidates or parties, right? right. So right. when you said you worked hard to elect President Trump, can you clarify that you were doing that in your individual capacities, right? And, well, we and were doing, yeah. Well, we were doing it in two ways, Karen. First of all, as a 501c3, we always push everyone to go out and vote the pro-life candidates. Now, President Trump made that pretty easy for us, especially in the third and final debate. I mean, Karen, mm -hmm. I was jumping yes. in my living room, yay, and cheering when he finally called out Hillary Clinton about, oh, well, she's for, this is what abortion is, he said, pulling the arms and legs off of babies. That's right. what she's for. That's what abortion is. And, and I'm not for that. And I will protect the unborn. You know, we had George W. Bush where we, we also helped to, because he was supposed to be pro-life. But President Trump dwarfed him in comparison uh, to what he did for, for the unborn in his presidency. And the fact, I think that last debate I would say Karen helped everyone to see quite clearly between the list of conservative justices he put out. And then that debate, I think, clinched it for pro-lifers who were still kind of going, well, is he the pro-life candidate? We knew Hillary Clinton was the 100 percent pro-abortion one. But I think when you say, Father, that's when he kind of sealed it and helped us oh, yeah. all, you know, right then and there. So all the work we did about telling people vote pro-life, vote pro-life as priests for life well, then it became crystal clear. Oh, then we have to vote for Trump. We didn't have to say go vote for Trump, Karen. He did it for us by saying I'm pro-life mm -hmm. and not being ashamed of it. I mean, he well, was organizations, C3 organizations <clears throat> can do a lot more than, uh, than, than they do sometimes. It, it, yeah. Than is, is, is often uh, thought because, right. you know, it's all educational work. You know, why, why, why we have to vote pro-life? Why is defending life the first duty of government? Right. Uh, and then even who are the pro-life candidates? A 501c3 can educate people as right. to where the parties <laughs> stand, where the candidates stand. We put out a lot of literature about that. Mm -hmm. and, oh, uh, and we have the party platform, which we right. still have. Compare the platforms. We the party right. platforms. You can have a piece, which we do, comparing the party platforms without expressing a preference on mm -hmm. that piece of literature. You know? Right. So, and that's And then finally, the other big thing we did, we promoted iVotaGuide, iVotaGuide.com. And Karen, that's a 501c3 friendly thing because they present all the candidates and they show the issues. So you just have to look at it and say, oh, look at this guy. Oh, look what they, they endorse. Oh. You know, it, it's really simple. The other thing we do tell people to do is go to the candidates' websites and see who endorses them, who's donating to them. That's also another red flag. You'll know a candidate is pro-abortion by seeing, oh, Planned Parenthood, Emily's List, you know, that whole cohort. Right. Well, then you know they're pro-abortion. If you see Susan B. Anthony List uh, endorsing them, national rights to life. Well, then that, then, you know, they're pro-life. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, when I say we work hard to, mm -hmm. to, um, uh, elect president Trump and all pro-life candidates, that's how we do it as a 501 C three. But then father Frank and I personally, as American citizens yes. endorse Trump, which you're allowed to do. Yes. Hello, clergy yes. out there. Hello, clergy. <laughs> I'm talking to you now. Right. Exactly. Yes. 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 You you can first of all get up in the pulpit and you can talk about the election. You can say you should vote pro-life. This is, you know, our faith. This is what it teaches. And here's how you can find out who the pro-life candidates are. Yeah, a lot and, of them and don't clergy, do that. when you're out of the pulpit and you're in the parking lot, you can say, Well, yeah, I'm gonna vote for the Trump or whoever the pro-life candidates are as a per private citizen. The problem is, Karen. They are so intimidated by by this nonsense of the Johnson Amendment and these other things. As so well, fearful. which, by the way, is not being enforced anymore. It's anyway. not being enforced, not but they're so anymore. fearful. Oh, we're going to lose our tax exempt status. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Guess what, Karen? Priests for life, we've always put to take our toe right to that line. We don't cross it right to the line. We were even audited by uh, the, the um, federal government there, the uh, income tax people and we 
pass well, with squeaky queen. But, but you know what it is, too? Just a one more sentence about this. Right. The line is vague, and that's yeah, one of the yeah. reasons we push it, because we challenge. Yes. We chal- you, you, can't, you can't enforce a law that it's is so, unclear. Right. You know, so we say, hey, listen, you know, you're telling us there's a line here. Yeah, exactly where is it? It's so vague. Right. It's not fair for you to, mm-hmm. to intimidate. Oh, us. And, and not to mention, Father, what about Ally- our friends Alliance Defending Freedom every September uh, during key election years? I'm sure they're going to do it again this year. They have that big Sunday where they, they tell the, the pastors, both, you know, to get into the pulpit and preach about the candidates, preach about the election. And not one church has lost their their tax exempt mm-hmm. status yet. Yeah. Yeah, All right. Great. Yeah. So Great. you know, Karen, I always say, you know, be bold. You know, I mean, yes. that's what God wants us to do. Not be afraid of our faith. Well, we were on the precipice. We, yeah. we were. I mean, had the election gone the other way, Hillary Clinton. Oh what my would gosh. You have, what would you have had? We right would have had, had three you've had, pro you would, abort. You would justices. have a six-three uh, uh, in the other direction, uh, left-wing radical, left-wing. out of control court. Right. Um, no. In it, in it would, in which case we we may not have seen Roe overturned in our we, lifetimes. We right. Would. Right. No, we wouldn't. Right. Have. No. So. It, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. And, you know, that was the turning. We knew that was the moment right there for victory. Right. Well, you know what? Let's just add one that more was- thing. Let's add one more thing about that. As we, and we're going to transition to actually talking about the Dobbs decision a little bit. Um, so even the timing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing in September of 2020 during that pandemic, um, you know, contentious election year and President Trump making that bold decision that he is going to nominate and the Senate, the leadership of the Senate agreeing to, you know, let <coughs> Amy Coney Barrett sit and get confirmed before the election. All of that uh, was incredible, incredible Thanks. and historic. It still required the Supreme Court to agree to take a case. Right. And, you know, thank I can just say thank thank God for that. We had enough Supreme Court <laughs> now to agree to take Dobbs. And I know that, you know, Robbie, Professor Robbie George was one of the early ones back in the fall. As soon as, <laughs> as soon as they agreed who he put out his big article making the bold. Um, what did he what did he prediction prediction? Carter Sneed agreed with him as well that. They had just given us the nod that this was going to be the case that would overturn Roe, that they would go so far in the Dobbs case to overturn Roe. And I, I so yeah, I know yeah. we, we were filled with anticipation and yet not knowing for sure, not knowing yeah, for yeah, sure. Right, right. Well, so I know, here's, yeah. <coughs> here's uh-huh. why we were so confident. It's the way they put, posed the question. Right. Okay. Are all uh, pre-viability bans on elective abortion <laughs> unconstitutional. Right. Now, that's what Roe and Casey were saying. Right. Yeah, they're unconstitutional. You can't protect these babies until viability. And it's like, <coughs> okay, if the right. court raised the question that way uh-huh. and they were going to end up going through an entire case and then just saying yes, yeah, they're all unconstitutional, by the way, folks, you know, and nothing changes. It's like, no, no, they're posing the question this way because, look, what can you say? You can either say yes, and all that is is, you know, we reaffirm Roe and Casey, right? or you say no. If you say no, so they're not all unconstitutional before the bans, that is, before uh, a viability, well, then you've just you've just dismantled Roe and Casey because right. that was the central point well, of those and, cases. And they, so it's like they were well, given to father several questions. They chose that. They chose question. that one. They chose that one question. And, and, and then the further thinking was this, because we know that president Trump's criterion, which is really the conservative criterion right. is that the judge sees his or her role not as not as uh, implementing their policy preferences them, for the, themselves, but as applying the Constitution right. as it's written and the existing <coughs> laws. Right. The existing law. They can't write them. They can't undo them. <coughs> they have right. to take the laws that are existing and apply them. Okay. Right. So the question becomes this. If you say 
okay, viability is no longer the point, you know, before which these bans are unconstitutional, then what are you going to do with that? If you say no, they're not all unconstitutional, then either <laughs> you have to draw another boundary line or you have to say, well, it's up to the legislatures. Right. And, and, and my thought was during that year, we remember, Karen, we had a whole year. Um, and this was more time than, than you often do have with these cases because they, they announced May of 17th, May 17th of 2021 uh -huh. that they were taking this case. So we yes. had a whole more than a year. And um, so during all that time, you know, we're thinking, OK, so if they say no, well, then I don't think they're going to draw another line, no. because if they draw another line, <laughs> they're legislating. You know, if this if the court were going to say no, no, you know, you, you, you know, you can you can protect these babies before viability, but we're going to draw the line at twelve weeks or ten weeks or well, you know, and fifteen even fifteen weeks. Where Mississippi, do. It's a, but I said no, they're not going to do that because they don't have the view that they're supposed to do that. They're not legislators. Right. So the only other option then is, hey, you know what? Leave it up to the states, and that's what they did. I, we should say yeah. more specifically, Karen. The led the people and the way they phrase mm -hmm. it is the people and their elected representatives. Right. So yeah, that's mostly the states, but it also includes federal. the federal Congress. Right. So and, okay, know, let's, too, Father, yeah. um, both Justice Thomas and Alito, but especially Thomas, he has already stated that the Supreme Court has to stop being the medical review board. Like they were just waiting to get abortion off their plates totally because of that. You know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, OK, so uh, let's touch on this just a minute here and then we'll get to the, the decision itself. I know that um, we know we know that there was many there were many people outside the Supreme Court during the day of oral arguments back on December 1st. And people were listening. I remember seeing being right here at my at my laptop, listening to oral arguments as I was working here at home in Dallas. And um we were very encouraged by the types of questions that the justices were asking. And I, I remember one of the things that um, sticks out in my mind is as uh, Justice Kavanaugh listing just this long list of, of cases where precedent had been reversed. You know, it wasn't like this few right. and far between a, a handful. I, it was a lot. So we, I know we were very encouraged. And then the, talk about unprecedented, the unprecedented leaking of the opinion back on May the 2nd kind of rocked the world where we could oh. see that it indicated that we we had a, a five justice majority to, in fact, overturn Roe. So that was exciting, but also it was like, oh, stirred up a whole lot of unrest. And there was all of the talk about, well, it's five, where does the chief justice land on this? Maybe speculation chief justice is going to try to lobby one of the other justices to not do this. Um, so, of course, we were in incredible prayer and anticipation, not knowing what day. Right. So just kind of uh, I like to think about the day it happened. We all we're all following SCOTUS blog on our phones. And I think it's so cool. We did not know it was going to be the 24th of June, but I think that everybody can, you know, kind of put in their lifetime bio of life events. Where were you the moment you heard that Roe v. Wade had been overturned? And I know in my case, I was in Florida. I was actually in Florida with our, our colleague, our wonderful friend, colleague Janine Marone. We were walking, praying the rosary. Um, I'm watching SCOTUS blog. You, I know, Father, you were at National Right to Life Convention. I know Abby Johnson had a whole lot of people gathered at Pro-Life Women's Conference. <laughs> Janet, you were live broadcasting as you were doing, as you were watching on Decision Days. But it's so interesting. Uh, someone else pointed this out. It, it was issued, the decision was issued, the second decision on June 24th, and it was at 10, 10 a.m. And someone pointed out later that day, I saw it um, online, that the scripture, John 10, 10, which encapsulates the battle, um, came to mind. And just, just hearing that too, you know, the precision, the thief comes to steal, slaughter, and destroy, semicolon. I came that they might have life and have it to the full. 
John 10, 10. We got this decision at 10, 10. I just think it's super, super cool. So the actual decision, and we all thought it initially, and I even have the headline here from the Dallas paper showing this row falls. And it says six to three. We all initially, when a SCOTUS blog said chief justice concurs, we thought we had six to three on Dobbs overturning Roe. It turns out it was five to four to overturn Roe, but Chief Justice concurred on upholding Mississippi, which to me, you know, and a lot of people comes across as a little bit seeming schizophrenic. Um, but Father, I want to just point to you just sent out on Monday uh, to our one, in one of our forums that you have a five part series. Uh -huh dissecting the Dobbs decision in layman's terms, and it's on YouTube. And I and you you, you began that la last Monday, three days after the decision was issued. And um, and I'm just, I, I've watched the first two of those. I can't recommend it highly enough. But Father, I mean, it's like you had already read the 200 page decision and, and there you are, you know, recording a five part series breaking it all down. And of course, the, there is no constitutional right to abortion. So how did you do that? And first of all, I want to like ask you all to please share where people can go to watch your five part series on that. But ha I know you have your pocket constitution of the United States. You, you, you truly are coming across as a teacher uh, at the whiteboard and all of that. So how were you able to do that so quickly, Father? Well, Karen, one of the reasons is that we had been doing it all along. If people go to SupremeCourtVictory.com, that's our, our special Supreme Court website, SupremeCourtVictory.com. And what we did there from early on, once the Supreme Court, as we mentioned earlier, announced in May of 2021 that they were taking the case, um, we began interviewing various attorneys uh, who were who had already been following this case because this case, you know, had percolated up through the court system and um, for some years already. And uh, uh, so we, we, we started talking with attorneys. We started talking with the state of Mississippi. We started talking with those who were crafting the friend of the court briefs. Uh, and and SupremeCourtVictory.com actually has, the, the of course, the five-part the series that you just mentioned. But before that, it has all these other interviews with uh, people who authored these briefs, we wrote one of them as well, and we were analyzing the arguments, right? So so we got really into the depth of the arguments that the state of Mississippi was making to the court, that the other side was trying to make uh, against it, and so forth. Then we got to the leak. Now, once the leak came out in May 2nd, we 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 analyzed that Absolutely. that document knowing that it wasn't official but convinced that it was going to be substantially uh, what the final decision was so we analyzed the alito leaked draft opinion and we did a whole series of programs about that uh, which are also at supremecourtvictory.com so once the final decision officially came out <clears throat> on june 24th we looked at it and 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 i saw right away that the arguments were the same that they had basically taken that that draft opinion and and made it official yes some changes here and there only because that the final opinion incorporates also the the, uh, the majority's response to the dissents the dissenting opinion right. of Breyer Kagan and Sotomayor so so uh, uh but but otherwise i mean the arguments are essentially the same so i was prepared already read through it uh, and I said, okay, this is this is what we've had already with the with the leaked draft, and so we put we were able to put together pretty quickly uh, that little series. So again, people can watch it at SupremeCourtVictory.com. Well, and the other thing, Karen, is you know a lot of people think they know a lot about Roe v. Wade, but see, Father Frank can sit here and say he has read Roe v. Wade and Dovey Bolton multiple times and analyzed it, then. When the leaked document happened, uh, the Alito document, that was uh, around nine o'clock at night. What did Father Frank do? He went to his computer and he downloaded it, but he had to download it. It was very tricky. He had to do it almost a page at a time. All right. Because he was afraid, oh, what if they take it down? So you didn't know what was going to happen. What was yeah. gonna happen. So he downloaded it and then he stayed up till 2 a.m. Hmm. reading it and analyzing it. Yeah. All right. And not to mention, he talked about all the uh, friend of the court briefs, like uh, we wrote one. There were about 60 of them. He read every one of them. Okay. So like 
he has been, I would call like an expert on this yes. because of, he has put in the hard work of, and for us, for the staff, well, yeah, he gives us classes. We have to read stuff. I mean, you know, it's just part of our job. We have to stay up to the minute. In well, forms, the know? other thing about it though, Karen, you already brought this up. The, the point here also is this. These arguments in this Dobbs case aren't difficult. No. They aren't difficult. Mm -hmm. You said it already. The very most basic point for everyone to keep in mind is very simple. The Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Right. That's it's the just not there. It's not there. <laughs> now, it's not there in the text of the Constitution. But here's the other key part of the argument. There are various rights that we have that are not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, but we understand them to be rights. Why? Because they're rooted in the history, the history of the country. So you can take those two things together, the text and also the history. And, um, and, and so that's what the court did. They said, okay, well, no is there something in American history, right. in the law, in other court decisions, in the, in the uh, uh, scholarly articles, in the uh, constitutions made of the states? Is there something somewhere that tells us that the American people, okay? Remember, we're talking about the people, we the people, right? We're not talking about the opinions of the judges. The we the people. Is there something showing that we the people have believed for these last 250 years or so in a, in, a, in a right to abortion. And so they looked at it very closely and they said, no, no, it's not there. Right. It's not, not there. there. So it fell out of the sky in 1973, basically, right. yeah. uh, is what happened. Absolutely you know? invented. So just one other point on this. And again, I, I and encourage everybody to go and just watch Father's breakdown of, of the, and this is Father and Janet, you're, you know, you're all are you guys are together in the studio and Janet, yeah. you're asking father questions and he's, you're explaining. Um, so what the court didn't do with Dobbs was to say that the constitution protects the right to life of every preborn person from, from the moment of conception. Right. Right. It, it, it didn't go that far under the 14th amendment. It did not right. go that far. It took the, what we call to the 50 yard line, um, you know, approach, which was the Constitution does not prohibit states from protecting life, right? So in, in terms of sending it back to the states, we still have a huge, huge dilemma. It's similar to slavery, where we have this now checkerboard where some states, it, it, it was legal to own slaves and in others it was not. N no people should truly in, in the, you know, moral scheme of things, be allowed to decide whether or not it should be legal to kill preborn children, right? I mean, we we've got to get, we've got to get the whole victory. And I know I I, I read uh, an article that was put out on First Things that suggests that even the way that Dobbs was was written leaves the door open for more cases to come up to the court to, to actually let them take a look at the Fourteenth Amendment well, well, and protecting life. You know, the other thing, Karen, is people might forget that the, first of all, the goal of Nellie Gray, who founded the March for Life, was always uh, a human life amendment. I yes. mean, her, that amend was the, the Constitution. amend the Constitution to have a human life amendment that mm -hmm. would protect the unborn. Now, here's another fact that a lot of people don't realize. That same goal is in the Republican party platform that's right is to their ultimate goal is to have a human life amendment it's in the party platform and of course in the democratic party it's to kill babies till birth and so, where else and very is clear. It, it's in the third place too the united states bishops catholic bishops pastoral plan for pro-life activities they put there There's as the ultimate goal ultimate, yeah. ultimate goal but, but, a human life amendment so karen let me answer the, the, this uh, too in this way uh, because it's an important point that you bring up the Dobbs decision says, we, the court, are not taking a policy position mm -hmm. on abortion. We are not issuing an opinion about how many rights the baby in the womb has. We are not, uh, we acknowledge that there is arguments on both sides. You know, the arguments on both sides were made in the briefs. They were made in the oral arguments. They're, they've been made for, for the last 50 plus years. Uh, we hear it. The justices are saying, we hear the we hear the arguments. We hear the weighty arguments. We hear the heartfelt, deeply emotional, filled with conviction arguments. 
He says, but it is not our job today to decide to take sides. We did take sides with Planned Parenthood versus Casey and with Roe ultimately, because we said you cannot, no matter how much you want to, no matter how much you're convinced, you can't protect these babies, at least not until viability. We took sides. Says now we are purposely not taking sides. And what we are saying is that the people and their, and their elected, elected representatives, representatives right. can work this out. But now let's take that for, let's build on that though. If they're saying the people and their elected representatives can work that out, well, then how can we work that out? Listen, we can work that out by electing and persuading these legislators to protect all the babies all the time in all the states and at the federal level. We can work this out through our elected representatives to make our case, which is far more persuasive than the pro-abortion case, and to keep putting it into the law more and more and more and more and more until we get to the point where Congress itself is willing to amend the Constitution, because this is still, this is not even in the courts. This is the people and their elected representatives. We can get the Congress ultimately to say, all right, not only are we going to make abortion illegal, we're going to amend the Constitution to make sure that it's the right to life stays firmly rooted and doesn't get changed by a future uh, uh, court or right. Congress. And, and we can say this, we can say, all right, then we turn to the states because to amend the Constitution, you also need three quarters of the states. But who, who does that? The people and their elected representatives. Right. So in other words, the, the, the Supreme Court has gotten out now, has backed away. It's actually a big act of repentance on the part of the court by saying, mea culpa, we got it wrong in the past. And you know what? We can't fix this. We can't resolve this dispute. We're going to leave it, it to the, the hands of the people. Well, so they backed out of the abortion policy making business. And I think at this point they should stay out of it. Let the people and their elected representatives work this out because we can work this out all the way to the point of a constitutional amendment without the court even having to intervene ever again. <laughs> Yeah, because that, that's going to be our ultimate goal. That's yeah. what will fix it 100%. Yeah. You know? And you know, Karen, um, th there's a lot of problem going on right now, as you know, in the media. Um, very few media outlets are being actually honest <laughs> about what this whole thing meant. And the hysteria that's going on about, uh, I, I mean, I'm getting all kinds of stuff on Facebook. Uh, that's what I'm doing is responding. Uh, I had uh, one person recently said, um, Oh, well, what about the, the women who have atopic pregnancies and miscarriages now? They can't get that fixed, you know, because you're outlawing abortion. So thank God, I don't know if you saw this, the Charlotte Loja Institute, on behalf of the uh, pro-life OBGYNs, issued a reply to all that where several uh, OBGYNs um, who are pro-life said, no, that doesn't affect that. You know, uh, atopic pregnancy and miscarriage, right. uh, the, the states that are banning abortion, the, that stuff can still be treated and, and stop dragging and scaring women. Stop scaring mm. women that they yeah. can't get these medical services. Yeah. They yes. will, you know, well, I mean, and, and the just other to challenge too, Karen, I think is so funny. You know, Planned Parenthood used to claim they're getting all this tax money and they're always saying, oh, oh, well, we provide all these other services like mammograms and this and that, and blah, 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 blah. Well then, okay, Planned Parenthood, here's the question. If, abortion is just a small fraction of your business, like you're claiming, then how come in states where they're outlawing abortion, you're closing your, your, your places? If it's such a small percentage, you should still be able to, you know, where's those mammography uh, machines? And where's all these other services that you're supposedly doing? Mm. You know, uh, clearing uh, people for STDs and all this other diagnostic female reproductive medicine that you're doing. Zero, Karen. That's right. why they're closing. They lie, lie, lie. Abortion is their cash cow. It always has been. And that's why they want to close those those places because they don't provide the other services. Mm. That's yeah. right. And also just it's a quick thing too. I, this is another thing we have to continue to work on toward the ultimate goal, which is constitutional amendment and protection. That's what we're in this for. That okay. every, 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 without exception, preborn life will be protected by the law and abortion is over. You know, this abortion nightmare in our in our country's history is, is over. But there is that misunderstanding and misconception, we hear it all the time, even among pro-lifers and pro-life elected officials, that you have to have the save the life of the mother exception for abortion. Ectopic oh. pregnancy is not an abortion, right? Right, right. There is no medically necessary 
life of the mother situation that would necessitate direct and intentional abortion to save the mother's life. Yes, there may be emergencies where the baby has to be delivered. Pre-viability will not survive. That is the principle of double effect. Father, you've taught on that over many years, but there is not a medically necessary reason that would ever require direct and intentional abortion. So right. that's something that we, we, we talk about quite a bit. Okay. So we're um, getting a little, I, this is, I knew this was going to be a, a little bit longer show because of the historic occasion that we have just experienced, but here we go where we're going. Now we already have um, praise God just since June the 24th, we now have 10 States. Uh, I just saw Ann Reed from um, operation rescue, put this out. She's got yeah. a uh, she's got a chart there showing the ten states where abortion is already fully illegal already, and um, excited about that. But we still we still have a huge battle in, ahead of us because of the highly populated states New York, California, Illinois who who you know say they want to be abortion sanctuaries, and then there will be those the demand for abortion has not gone down overnight. So there will be people in states like Texas who will be looking for abortions to go to other states to get those abortions. So we have this checkerboard and and this battle that we will continue to fight. And I know there's a lot of effort going on to you know focus on those states where abortion is still legal. And um, so we'll be putting all of our collectively in the movement, putting our heads together on how best to, you know, fight the battle in this new this new landscape uh, going forward. Now, priests for life. <laughs> Y'all, again, you've been you've been in existence since the early 90s. Um, you've got the name priest for life, but you have a lot of ministries under you. And I know that you also operate under a, a DBA called and abortion.us, yeah. which I think a yeah. lot of people have are not aware of. So as we, as we wrap up here at the uh, final segment of this um, show, and I guess thank you guys again so much for taking the time with us today, please explain the mission of priest for life, the ministries that are under priest for life, and uh, anything else that you'd like to share? How I know you have numerous URLs, which is genius. Um, but how can people best follow you and learn about you and get engaged in in what you guys are doing? All right. Well, you know, Karen, there's one phrase we have. It's on our sign outside our building. Uh, we're not ashamed about what we do, and it says activating and equipping God's people to end abortion. Right. Simple as that. If I have to have one sentence, someone said to me, describe your mission, Janet, in one sentence, that's it. Equipping and activating God's people to end abortion, period, amen. That's our goal. But, you know, we also have Rachel's Vineyard, uh, the largest abortion recovery program in the world. We're in about 76 countries, translated in 26 languages. That's part of our ministry. Of course, the Silent No More Awareness campaign that I co-founded with Georgette Forney, the women and men and family members speaking about about their regret once they've been healed. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, Stand True, our youth division. Uh, we have Deacons for Life, Seminarians for Life, and, of course, Priests for Life. Uh, so we activate the clergy, and we have a new project called the Good Shepherd Project, where we are doing uh, Zoom seminars for the clergy, which will kick up back again in September. Uh, let's see. What else, Father? Did I forget anything? Well, we uh, we we work we work with political responsibility. Political we have a whole respons political responsibility outreach right. that has um, helped in past elections. Right. Is helping in the current elections. Training seminars for for voters who want to. And they to, can go um, to ProLifeVote.com, sign up to be an election volunteer because we right now we have monthly Zoom calls. Come September, they'll be weekly training yeah. everyone what to do for the elections. Right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, education and mobilization in terms of the voters. And we also do a whole lot of international work as well. Uh, Marie Smith uh, heads up our international outreach. We're an NGO at the United Nations. We're right. a member group at the Organization of American States. Uh, we are uh, working hand in hand with the Vatican. Right. And we're working with <laughs> legislators in other countries because this Dobbs case has international impact. And uh, we're helping legislators elsewhere to defend the unborn. So right. it's a, like, a, a, a Karen... A short answer to the question is endabortion.us is the web, a web address. <laughs> One stop. They can see all these different right. aspects of our work 
meet our, our wonderful team, connect it with us on social media, and sign up for the many action right. alerts that we send out in each of these different And arenas. finally, we've expanded our resource department so they can go to uh, um, our, our online store at prolifeproducts.org. And I have, which maybe I'll come back another time to talk to you, Karen, my brand new book, which actually I wrote last year, it was published in April by Tan Books called Everything You Need to Know About Abortion for Teens, but I had the line adults too. <laughs> and in the atmosphere we're in right now, it's a perfect book because I take on all the all the hard arguments, like you were saying, life of the mother, fetal anomaly, uh, the whole nine yards. Uh, rape and incest. I talk about selective reduction. I talk about IVF. I mean, it's all covered there. And the center of the book, Karen, they let me put in pictures of the unborn baby starting at seven weeks. Nice. So uh, that's a great thing. If you want to get a copy of that book, just go to abortionandteens.com. I will personally autograph it for you. And for youth groups out there, it, we have discounts. Just contact our office. We give you quantity discounts. And then I will arrange after the kids have read the book to do a complimentary Zoom meeting, meet the author and answer questions. So we're all about educating everyone, Karen, right now. And we're just going full steam ahead. Yes. Okay. So endabortion.us is, and I wanted to, I wanted to make sure to talk about that father because, and Janet, because when people hear of priests for life, they may think, oh, that's for priests. I'm not a priest or, oh, that must be a Catholic thing. And it truly, truly is so much more than that. And uh, you, you guys have just been doing such amazing, amazing, impactful work for decades now. And I just can't thank you enough. Uh, so and oh, and you have uh, you have a lot of social media. You have a program, Janet. Talk about your show. And Father, you have a you podcast. Yeah, we broadcast every day. We're sitting here in our TV studio and a daily broadcast and abortion dot tv so you take the u.s turn it into tv and uh there's i do mass every day when i'm not traveling i have um other prayer hours that 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 broadcast we have our educational yeah. programs and and i have a program called just ask janet and we just started a weekly uh news program that Teresa uh, watson and leslie palma on our staff produce and that uh, it's on Friday nights at seven. My program comes on at nine o'clock. Uh, Brian Kempen does a program also on Thursday nights at nine. So we are really uh, streaming and we stream on, like Father said, endabortion.tv. We're also on Roku, Amazon Fire, and a whole bunch of other platforms. Well, all programming. kinds of social media platforms, Twitter yeah. and, and Twitter, uh, Getter. And, Getter and, and, uh, and Father and does also uh, every Monday through Friday at eight o'clock, which is also streaming there, but for RSBN. Pray for America, where he has some uh, great guests and uh, and a prayer time, because uh, that we always, of course, have to be praying for an end to abortion all the Amen. time. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, I I, I need to. We're, we're really close to wrapping up now. Um, a couple minutes ago, and I said we would be, you know, focusing on protecting the children in the states where it's still legal. I want to make sure that I say uh, very clearly: we know now in this post row America that there will be many more mothers who are choosing life and who are because they can't get an abortion in their state and and they you know they can't travel to get an abortion and so we just want to say loud and clear that we have always from the beginning from the time Roe first came down we we are for both we are not just about the children we are about the mothers and the families. We love everyone. We love them both. And the pro-life movement is here in force to come alongside every woman who may be experiencing an unexpected pregnancy and needs support, needs love, needs help. We want to encourage everyone, make sure you know where your local pregnancy center is that will help moms to be able to choose life and carry their children to term. And, and even if they they need help beyond that, the pro-life movement is here for the women. And also you mentioned Rachel's Vineyard, but we know from, some, from nationwide research that we did in conjunction with our friends at Support After Abortion, that the nine out of 10 who would like to get healing don't know where to go for healing. So there are many, many, many who are suffering out there and, um, if you or anyone you know has been adversely impacted by abortion, 
please know that there are numerous abortion recovery and healing uh, programs available to you in this country. You just don't know about them. One of the places that we um, advertise for people to learn more about is supportafterabortion.com. You all um, are, you have rachelsvineyard.org. That's the main URL for, for those uh, who are Right. And then Karen, we also have abortionforgiveness.com. Okay. You put in your zip code and you will see where the nearest Rachel's Vineyard um, and um, some uh, like a whole bunch of other um, uh, abortion recovery programs are. And also, if they're looking for their uh, pregnancy center, just go to pregnancycenters.org and there too, put your zip code in. You will see the nearest pregnancy center to where you live. And the challenge here, brothers and sisters, why don't you go there and visit the pregnancy center, see what it's about so that you can be an ambassador for that pregnancy center. Maybe you'll volunteer and maybe you'll donate to them too. So again, pregnancycenters.org in a post row America, we should be checking those out so that we can spread the word far and wide. Thank you for that so much, Janet. So, okay. <sighs> We're uh, at the end here. I got to thank you guys again so much. We've learned so much. I've learned a lot. I hope everyone who's watching and listening has learned a lot in this special episode. At just a word on National Prayer Luncheon for Life, our nominations for the 2023 Pro Life Impact Award and Pro Life Impact Grants will open up on October the 1st, and we'll have that, that uh, nominations period open. And then please save the date and mark your calendars for Friday, April the 21st from 12 to 1 Central Time. That is when we'll have our annual National Prayer Luncheon for Life event. Please be sure to share this episode with others so that they can learn as well, and be sure to come back each week where you can learn more about how you can make the greatest impact to save lives from the evil of abortion. And with that, Father, since we have you, I gotta thank you guys so much for all that you have done and continue to do and for your incredible leadership and, and using your gifts for God's glory and for for this this great mission we've been called to. So Father, as we have you with us today, I would be so blessed and we would be so blessed if you could close us in prayer and, and give a blessing for, for all who are watching and listening. By all means, thank you. Let us pray. Father, we praise and thank you. Enable your people to celebrate this moment. Enable this great pro-life movement that has worked so hard for so long to celebrate and enjoy this moment of victory with the falling of Roe v. Wade. And Lord God, renew us in our commitment to protect every child, every place, and uh, to use the, the, the lawmaking process that you have given us in this great nation of freedom uh, to accomplish that goal. Bless all those who, who may be having abortions or those who are hurting from a past abortion. Bless all the pro-life activists and ministries and bless us as we move forward humbly and confidently in your name. We pray in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. And may the Lord bless each of you in your pro-life work in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Oh gosh. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for all of this. Uh, we just love and appreciate you so much. And thank you all for joining us. And be sure to come back next week. God bless you. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining today's show. And be sure to subscribe to our National Prayer Luncheon for Life Pro-Life Impact Podcast Show and help spread the word. Come back every week to learn how you can make the greatest impact to help save lives from the evil of abortion. God bless.